We are working on practice problems for Chapter 8C, Even More Time Value of Money, and we will get right into it. Right, so question A, calculate the effective rate, assuming an APR of 10% compounded quarterly. So my first step when I usually see APR in a problem, I go ahead and compute that to R. R is the units in which you're going to solve most of your problems with. Um, since this is a very straightforward question, it specifically asks for the EAR, then you're going to take the APR, make it an R, and then take it that extra step further and find the EAR. That extra step going from R to EAR is not something that you have to do for your calculations, usually. But we'll go ahead. Given that APR is 10% quarterly, we'll find R, and R is just equal to 10%, or the APR, divided by the number of periods within a year. So it's just 10% divided by 4 since it's quarterly. All right, and it's 25%. All right, and we're going to take R and put it into our EAR formula, equivalent annual rates. If you remember what that formula is, I'm going to write it right up here. All right, so just using that formula, we're going to take 1 plus R. Put that to the power of 4 because that's how many compounding periods are happening annually. And then subtract that all by 1. All right, and a little bit over 10% is our answer for question A. Question B. An investment will pay you $90,000 in 10 years. If the APR is 10% compounded daily, what is the present value? So again, the first step in solving these problems when given an APR is to, for me at least, just immediately convert that to R. So that way it is useful for these present value and future value formulas because you're not using APR in this formula. You're not using A, E, A, R. You are just using R, which is your native units. All right, so APR is 10% compounded daily, which means that R is equal to that rate divided by the number of times compounded a year, so 365. And we are also given the future value, because in 10 years we will receive $90,000. And we are also given T, but we are given T in years. Remember that for present value and future value formulas, our rate and our time, they have to be in the same units. So because R is in days, T also has to be in days. So we're given 10 years, so we're given 10 years, we need to convert that to days. You just take 10 and multiply that by 365, and now we are good to go to solve our present value, since our rate and our time are both in the same units. Okay, so present value is just taking your future value, divided by 1 plus rate, all to the power of t. All right, so the initial investment for this proposal that will be $90,000 in 10 years is only $33,000 and some dollars. All right, moving on to question C. The appropriate APR for the following cash flows is 10% compounded quarterly. Then we're given the cash flows, and then we're asked what the total present value of all the cash flows are. So first thing I'm going to do is, again, we're given APR, so I'm going to immediately go ahead and convert that to R. So we're given that APR is equal to 10% quarterly. All right, and changing that to R, we're going to take that 10% and divide it by 4 because there are four quarters in a year. Now, in this case, we have two options. We can either go ahead and compute using our R, which is technically in quarters right now, um, and go ahead and make sure that all of our time values are also in quarters, or we can go ahead and just use the EAR, which is the equivalent annual rate. So that will just be taking this little R and making it, turning it into an annual rate. And then once we have that annual rate, we can use that with the given years, and it'll be a very simple present value calculation. So that's the route that I'm going to go ahead and take, and I'm going to demonstrate. So EAR is just 1 plus R to the number of compounding periods in the year, which is 4, all minus 1. All right, and now we can go ahead and solve for that present value. So PV is going to be equal to our $800 that we get at the end of year 1 divided by 1 plus our equivalent annual rate, because again, our time units are in years, so we're going to use our annual rate, to the first. Technically, you don't really have to put the next one in, though, since it's the power of one. And then we're going to add the cash flow we get at end of year two. So we're going to add the 950, and we're going to bring that back to present value. So we're going to divide 
by 1 plus our equivalent annual rate. We're going to put that to the power of 2 because we're discounting it back 2 years. And then we get that final cash flow. So we're going to add that 1500 divided by 1 plus our equivalent annual rate to the power of 4. Just to confirm what I was saying earlier about your ability to just keep this in your little r units, if you were to convert the time to quarters, you're going to get the exact same result. So I'll solve that right down here. So the present value is equal to the cash flow you get at the end of year one. It's so one plus little r, or your interest rate in native units, to the power of your time in the same units as r. So in this case, year one, if it's in time units of quarters, is equal to four. You do that for every single cash flow. So you know, add 950 divided by one plus little r to the power of eight. Alternatively, you, I could be doing this as in two times four. Perhaps that's a better way to demonstrate the years times the number of compounded that years gets us our t in the same units as our little r. All right, and we'll get that final cash flow in. So that's 1500 divided by one plus little r, all to the power of four years times four. All right, and we get the exact same answer. So again, this is using our equivalent annual rate and years just as years, and it's using our little r, and we're converting the years to quarters. All right, I hope that will make sense, and we'll move on to question D. You are planning to make monthly deposits of $500 into retirement account with an APR of 9% interest compounded annually. If your first deposit will be made one month from now, how large will your retirement account be just after two months? Just after your second deposit. Round your answer to the nearest dollar. All right, that's a lot of information, so we'll write down what we know. Okay, our monthly deposit is going to be $500. Our APR is 9% and it is compounded monthly. Okay, so it's important to just make sure that we understand what's happening time-wise here. So currently, we are at t equals zero, and we're gonna have zero dollars in that account. We do not put a thing into that account until a month from now, when we will put our first deposit in. So at t is equal to one, we will have exactly the amount of that deposit, because we had just put that amount of money in. And at t is equal to two months, which is what we're looking for here. At least in two months, we're going to have that first deposit plus interest on first deposit plus second deposit. Or in other words, we are going to have the future value of first deposit after one month plus the value of our second deposit, which we know is going to be $500. Okay, so now we have that we have our timeline, we can go ahead and solve. So we're given APR. Again, that is not useful information at all for us. So let's go ahead and convert that to R. R is going to be the APR divided by the number of times the APR is compounded in a year. So monthly, that'd be 12 times a year. So little r is 0.75%. Okay, and this should be enough information to figure out what the value of our retirement account is going to be at time is equal to two. We're going to take that first deposit, which is $500, and we're going to find the future value of that one month after we made that deposit. So we're going to take that $500, and we're going to multiply it by one plus little r, or our interest rate in monthly units. We're going to put it all to the power of t. t in this case is just going to be one because one month has passed, and this is consistent with our interest rate, so that's all checks out and we're good to go. All right, so remember, this is just the future value of that first deposit. The total value of the whole account is going to be this first deposit plus your second deposit of $500. All right, so it says round to the nearest dollar, so we're to say that you have $1,004 in your account at the end of month two. Question E, you've just joined an investment banking firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. They've offered you two different salary arrangements. You can have A, $85,000 per year for the next two years, or you can have B, $70,000 per year for the next two years, along with a $20,000 signing bonus today. The bonus is paid immediately and the salary is paid in equal amounts at the end of each month. If the appropriate APR is 9% compounded monthly, what is the present value for option B? 
Okay, so for this question, we only really have to evaluate option B. So let's figure out what information they gave us for that. Salary is $72,000 per year. We're also told that salary is being paid in equal amounts at the end of each month. So we are going to go ahead and convert this to a payment at the end of each month. So we're going to take the yearly salary and divide it by 12. This is our monthly salary. We were also told that we would get $20,000 signing bonus today. So $20,000 today is equal to $20,000 today. So we're not going to have to do much with that value. That is important information to write down. All right, and we are told that the APR is 9% compounded monthly. So again, we can't do anything with APR. It's just not useful. So we'll go ahead and solve for our native interest rate, which is the APR divided by the number of compounding periods per year, which in this case is 12. So we're asked for the present value of option B. So what we really have to do is figure out what the present value is of the salary payments that we're getting in addition to our signing bonus. So we'll think about this as two separate parts here. If we're thinking just about the salary that we're getting, we should register this as an annuity because it is a constant cash flow that we're getting at the end of each month. Recall that the difference between an annuity due and an annuity is that annuities are paid at the end of each month and annuities due are paid at the beginning. So we're going to go ahead and use our present value formula for an annuity, which is just the cash flow that we're getting every single month. So that is the $6,000 multiplied by our numerator is 1 minus 1 plus little r to the power of negative time. Time in this case to be consistent with our little r has to be in months. So we're getting this constant cash flow for a total of 24 months because we are getting it for the next two years. So we're going to raise this to the power of 2 times 12, because you're doing 2 years and they're 12 months in a year, or you can just do it to the power of 24. All right, and our denominator is just going to be little r. All right, and this just solved for our present value of the salary payments. Total present value of option B is going to equal the present value of all the salary payments plus that $20,000 signing bonus. All right, and our answer is $151,334.88. Question F. The appropriate interest rate for the following cash flows is 8% compounded quarterly. What is the value of cash flows at t is equal to 3.8? All right, so this might look complicated, but this is just a future value problem. Just remember to be consistent with R and T. Make sure those are always kept consistent. We're told in this problem that R is in quarters and T is in years. So you have two options. You can either turn R into the equivalent annual rate, so that way R is in years as well, or we can turn T into quarters. I think I'm going to go ahead and turn R into the equivalent annual rate. So we're given R, and R is 8% quarterly. We find our equivalent annual rate. That is just going to be 1 plus R to the number of compounding periods per year, which is 4, all minus 1. All right, so our equivalent annual rate is 36%. And now we're good to go ahead and solve for our future value. So the future value of these two cash flows at t is equal to 3.8 is going to be equal to the first cash flow, which is 850. I'm going to multiply that by 1 plus our EAR. All right, so this is where it gets kind of tricky. So we have to take our cash flow at the end of year one and find out what that's worth at t is equal to 3.8. Might sound complicated, but all you have to do is take the time that you want of the cash flow, which is 3.8 years, and subtract that from the time that you actually receive the cash flow, which is one. I hope this makes sense, but this is going to be the value that 850 grows to in the 2.8 years that it takes. For us to reach time is equal to 3.8 years. If it doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to go ahead and draw out a timeline just on a scrap piece of paper and hopefully kind of visualizing the cash flows will help you. All right, and now we have to figure out what that second cash flow is worth at time is equal to 3.8. So we take that second cash flow and we multiply it by 1 plus our equivalent annual rate all to the power of 3.8 minus the time that we got this cash flow, which is end of year two. So this cash flow had 1.8 years to grow. So you could just put 1.8 if you want to for this exponent. Hopefully this all makes sense. A little note here before we continue to question G. The remaining questions are all about semi-annual pay bonds, which pay half of their coupon every six months. All right, so question G. Tesla has just issued its first bond. It's a 10-year issue with a $1,000 face value and a 5% coupon rate. What is the R for this bond? All right, and we're given a hint. I'm just going to rewrite this note because that's what I would do if I was working on a scrappy paper. So I'm going to write down that R is in semi-annual units. All right, now when we turn to the, to the information given, so we are given that the face value of this bond, or in other words, you can think about it as the future value of this bond, is $1,000, and the coupon rate is 5%. All 
All right, and upon review of this question, we don't even need to know what the future value is because it's not asking us to do anything with that amount of money or calculate any present value, future value formulas. This question is only asking us to convert the coupon rate into R. So coupon rate is kind of an annual rate that's given for these semi-annual pay bonds. So converting that to R, we have to take that annual rate so we take that 5% and just divide it by 2, and 0.025 is the appropriate R for this bond. All right, question 8. Cessna issued its first bonds on January 1st of 2001. The bond has a $1,000 face value, a 5% coupon rate, and it matures on January 1st, 2010. Today, January 2nd, 2008, the bond is trading at $1,060 per bond. Create a table that best represents the remaining contractual cash flows for this bond. All right, so create this table, we're going to have a date column to know when our cash flows are happening, and we're going to have a cash flow column. That's just going to let us know the magnitude of the cash flow that we're getting. All right, so we think about it. Today is January 2nd, 2008, so we're not going to receive the next cash flow until July 1st of 2008 because it does take us a full six months to get that next one. So I'm going to go ahead and write that date down. All right, and if we assume we hold this bond to maturity, I'm just going to write in the rest of the dates to make sure we have that part correct. The next cash flow we're going to get will be January 1st of 2009, and then July 1st, 2009, and then January 1st, 2010 is when this bond is going to mature. And so let's figure out some information given over here. We have given the face value of this bond is $1,000. We're given the coupon rate is 5%. Semi-annual pay bonds. Always going to be in semi-annual units, though. So we'll go ahead and figure out what R is, which is that coupon rate divided by 2. And using this little R, we're able to figure out what the payment that we're getting, what that, what that cash flow is. So we're going to go ahead and figure out what the payment is by taking that face value of the bond and multiplying it by our semi-annual rate. So pay this payment is what we're getting every six months. So if you bought this bond at $1,060, on July 1st, 2008, you're going to get $25. On January 1st, 2009, you're going to get $25. And on July 1st, 2009, you'll get another $25. Upon maturity of this bond, you are going to get that cash flow again, because you promised that cash flow every six months. So another six months has passed since July 1st. So you'll get that $25. And you will, in addition, get that full face value of that bond. So we get that $1,000 as well. And this is a complete answer for this problem because these are the remaining cash flows for this bond. I hope this made sense. Again, if it didn't, I really encourage you guys to go ahead and just draw out a timeline for yourselves. And hopefully that helps. All right, so question I. Walmart issued a bond on January 1st, 2001. The bond has a $1,000 face value, a 6% coupon rate, and it matures on January 1st, 2010. Today, January 2nd, 2008, the bond is trading at $960 per bond. The remaining contractual cash flows for this bond are listed below. And this cash flow table looks very similar to what we just did before. The only difference in figuring out the contractual cash flows for this bond is the coupon rate. Okay, and this question is asking us to figure out what R is for this bond. Or rather, the question is phrased, which is closest to the R for this bond today? I'm assuming if this was a Canvas quiz that it would go ahead and give you about four or five possible R values. And then you would have to figure out which one's the best option. Since I don't have any R values to go off of, I'm not going to go ahead and do plug and check. But I can show you an Excel function that would allow us to figure out what R is. So in the bond world, when a bond is trading at a discount or less than its face value, so this bond is trading at $960, not the face value of $1,000, that means that at the very least, we know that the interest rate or little r for this bond is going to be different than that stated coupon rate. So what we are going to end up doing is putting in a present value formula of all these future cash flows and we're going to be changing the r until we get a number that gets us a $960 present value because that's what this bond is currently being valued at in the bond market. So to start I'm just going to put in a random percent for this r. You can choose 10%, you can choose 1%, it doesn't really matter because we're going to edit this and change this until we find one that works for this bond. Um, to start off, I'm gonna go ahead and put 3% in. We know that 3% is not gonna be our answer because little r is not gonna be equal to that semi-annual coupon rate um, because the current valuation of this bond and the face value do not add up. Little r is not gonna equal 3%. And then we'll just continue with a bunch of present value calculations. So we'll take that first future cash flow, one plus little r, power of one, 
plus 30. Okay, so what I have here is just that July 1st, 2008 cash flow, that January 1st, 2009 cash flow, that July 1st, 2009 cash flow, and then finally I'm going to add in that January 1st, 2010 cash flow. This is the final cash flow that you're going to be receiving. It will include both that coupon payment and the face value of the bond. So it will be 30 plus 1,000 divided by 1 plus R to the fourth. All right, and when we hit enter, this should all equal 1,000 because we are using the semi-annual coupon rate. Okay, so everything checks out. We did our formula correct. Now we can kind of start just playing around with this R value. So we can first see what happens when we decrease the R value. So if we put in a 2%, okay, so apparently if we decrease the R value, our present value is going to increase. You can see that again, if I go all the way down to 1%, it jumps again. This is not the direction that we want to be moving. So we'll bring it back to 3%. We will see what happens when we increase our little R. What we should see happen is the present value is going to drop. So if we put in 5% here, we get about 930. This is not quite what we're looking for. We went a little bit too far, so I'll put in 4%. All right, we get 963. If we kept going and just started messing with all these decimal places in here, we could finally figure out exactly what R is and guess that particular present value. However, you don't have this much time on an exam to go ahead and keep running those calculations, especially because you don't have Excel. So remember, just during an exam, you go ahead and take the given R values and you plug them into the present value formula and you figure out which R value is going to get you the, one, the number that is closest to the $960 present value. Because I do have Excel available, I am going to just going to go ahead and show you how I would solve this using Excel. So if you go to your data tab, what if analysis, and you hit full C, this box pops up. I'm just going to demonstrate how it works. So you go ahead and set cell, whatever cell your present value formula is in, you set that cell to $960 because you want to figure out what R is going to get $960. And you're going to do that by changing R. And if we hit OK, Excel is going to run a bunch of reiterations of the present value formula and they're going to figure out which value of R is going to get us to that $960 present value. So when I hit Enter, present value is going to jump to $960 and our R value is going to change to the exact R for this bond. All right, so we find that the correct R should be 4.1%. Again, that's not something that you have to know for this course. I just think it's a useful tool that Excel has. And I hope this whole overview of practice problems was helpful.